Welcome to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Natasha Moore. And I'm Simon Smart. Well, among other big events the world has its eyes trained on this year is the US presidential election. We've all watched in amazement, and for a lot of us, trepidation, as Donald Trump has risen to Republican Party nominee. So he'll be going up against Hillary Clinton in November. And as with every US election, religion has a role to play as various religious groups put their support behind one or other of the candidates, and for vastly different reasons. Yes, many evangelicals seem to be throwing their lot in with Donald Trump. Others believe that's unthinkable as a Christian person. So it brings up a very complex relationship between religion and politics in the US. Well, to help us untangle some of that complexity is Professor Daryl Bock from Dallas Theological Seminary, a New Testament expert, but also the author of numerous books including How Would Jesus Vote? We've had Daryl in a number of times. Great to have you back, Daryl. It's good to be back. Here in Australia, voting is compulsory, but of course it's not in the US. So I suppose before we can even ask uh, how would Jesus vote is the question, would Jesus vote? Well, that's what a lot of people would ask is whether, whether he would vote or not. I think he would urge people to be good citizens of the society that they're a part of, and as a result, uh, he would be likely... Uh, to vote how vocal he would be and how, um, how can I say this, how without qualification he would give an endorsement. That might be a whole nother matter. Yeah, well, in, in the U.S. Um, politics, and this is something that doesn't really come up here in Australia, but there is a tendency to use the Bible or to at least to use faith to back political claims and positions. Uh, is that problematic, do you think? I don't think it's necessarily problematic if you think about what the Scripture is attempting to do, which is to ask the question, how do we live together best as people, even people of a variety of backgrounds? Uh, How do we faithfully walk with our neighbor? How do we think about our role in the world uh, and what we're supposed to do as we uh, live and serve our neighbor, those kinds of questions. That's Those are the kinds of questions the Scripture is concerned about. There's certainly been problems, though, haven't there, in terms, especially in the last sort of 20 or 30 years, in terms of certain uh, religious groups being very closely tied to political programs and parties. It hasn't been a great resolve, at least from my perspective. No, I think that's right. I, I think that uh, to the extent that people want to hold on to power, and particularly power at any cost, um, that tends to compromise the ethical dimensions of particularly a a Christian who's thinking about how I live in the world. What happens then when the Bible seems to support not only different ideas, but actually sometimes opposing ideas? The point of the book that I was writing was to say that we live in a fallen world, which is a way to say the world is full of tension. Uh, People don't treat each other the way they ought to. Uh, There are often conflicting values that are at work. And I actually think when you look at Scripture as a whole, you see that. You see the things in tension. So what we're supposed to do is to sit back and wrestle with the balance. But what tends to happen is each side of the political spectrum picks one aspect of the biblical portrait and says, that's where I'm placing my lot. And then they ignore those passages that push against that stand. And the scripture's open and honest enough to say, life is full of tension, uh, and tension needs wisdom to be sorted out. And, and so the appeal of the book is to say, here are the tensions and the issues that we face that need to be negotiated out. And when each side only takes one side of the conversation, what we get is gridlock and tribalism rather than uh, something that works towards a solution that hopefully can help us all live together better. So, Daryl, separation of church and state. This is a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, um, and it's you know, a specifically American That's right. phrase. What does it mean? Does it not mean that the Bible shouldn't actually be in these debates? Well, what it meant historically in the United States is that there was no state church. People were not uh, required to belong to a particular denomination or a particular expression of faith, that people had freedom of religion. The separation of church and state goes under the umbrella of religious freedom. And so the idea isn't and never was, at least initially, that you shouldn't have ethical discussions that you shouldn't draw on whatever wisdom you can, including the scripture, to have those conversations. That belongs in the public square. In fact, George Washington, there's a quote in the book where I cite George Washington's farewell address. He's kind of the father of the nation and, you know, leaving his legacy behind. And he basically says, if a society doesn't have 
some sense of moral compass, some sense of religious values, it will be unstable. Our Constitution was written with that understanding. It divided power so that no one would have so much power they could use it irresponsibly. And so separation of church and state is an attempt to give people the freedom to live by their conscience, by their religious beliefs, or without religious beliefs if they so choose, and everybody's supposed to respect those choices. Now, Daryl, the Bible's an ancient book. It's written at a particular time and place for a particular people. Now, what wisdom can it really offer for what are today very concrete, context-specific contemporary issues? It's an interesting question. It would be a little bit like asking, you know, is there value in studying people like Aristotle and Plato and that kind of thing? I mean, the human condition... I understand that. But actually what you see is anyone who has any sense of history at all understands that the human condition to some degree is the human condition. The circumstances around it change, but people are people. And people have wrestled with being people and living around people who are different than them, you know, the entirety of people's history. And the Scripture has had an incredible role, positive role, in society and in civilization for getting people to think about how to do things like love their neighbor. I mean, the golden rule is, a, is an idea that you see in Greco-Roman philosophy, but it's stated most emphatically in Scripture. And so uh, those kinds of values are just things that help us to live better. So I think the value of Scripture isn't just that it's a religious book. I think the value of Scripture is it has something very essential and authentic to say about the way people should live, regardless of where they come from. You're listening to Life and Faith, and you've just joined us. We're speaking with Professor Daryl Bock from Dallas Theological Seminary about his book, How Would Jesus Vote? So let's dive into a few of the specific issues here. Okay. I want to ask you about race. Okay. So we're going to tackle some really enormous right. ideas here, but let's wade in. So race is obviously a massive issue in the U.S., At the moment, um, tensions seem to be increasing all the time. And you're from Dallas, where five police officers were killed just recently. In fact, a few blocks from where my wife works. Oh, so what's the feeling in Dallas at the moment? I think the problem here is is that people have lived in the context of two different realities and don't understand uh, how the other half lives. Um, we've done podcasts. I do podcasts in the States. And we've done podcasts with African-American church leaders who have talked about um, what it's like to live as an African-American in the United States. In fact, the first question I asked on the podcast is, tell me as a white person what I don't get about being black and living as a black person in the United States. I just opened the door and he just said things like, you know, how often have you been pulled over and stopped just for being in a neighborhood? No other reason than you're the wrong color in the in the wrong neighborhood. There's no cross understanding about how other people live. And without really good cross conversation where some really serious listening goes on, people are not going to break out of their uh, their lack of awareness about what is going on around them. So are there biblical principles that can that have something to offer into this situation? Well, the first biblical principle that's, that leaps at us is everyone's made in the image of God. Every life deserves respect. And then from there, the idea of listening to your neighbor, caring enough to listen to your neighbor and to hear what they're saying is, is good. I, te- I see this as an interesting issue. Most people will recognize that we are designed and have to learn how to function together, that reconciliation is a great idea, like peace. But Everyone struggles with how to get there because the way they've been brought up in the world as they see it is so dominating that sometimes they can't understand someone else's reality that's different than theirs. Okay, Daryl, you're from Texas. I want to ask you about guns. All right. <laughs> now, <laughs> this is very hard, I yeah. have to say, for yeah. people from other cultures yeah, to I get understand. It. Yes. it seems so straightforward at one level, yes. but it's so difficult in America, even to have a conversation about any sort of restriction. Yeah. Help me out here. This looks crazy to me, but what's going on? Well, this is a reality that our country decided on 200 years ago that we now have to live with because we have over 200 million guns in circulation in the, in the United States uh, and, and it comes out of the revolutionary period in which people wanted to maintain the right to stand their ground and defend themselves against the British presence in the country. You might understand that as Australians. <laughs> and so, uh, so it was built into our Constitution. So we made a decision 200 years ago that we're now having to live with. There's no way to uh, put all those weapons back into some hermetically sealed box and pull them off the streets. Yeah, maybe not. But, I mean, 
two hundred years ago, we were going around in horses and wagons, and and it also you could take about five minutes to reload your gun. That's right. So the situations change. Why That's right. can't there be a serious look and an adjustment to this? Well, there can and should be. I mean, if you're asking what should happen, then the question is, you know, there are certain weapons that people don't need to have the right to have in order to do their hunting or whatever it is that they do on a recreational basis with their weapons. When I wrote the chapter on gun control, I made the point, there's nothing that prevents having solid background checks. There's nothing that prevents the restriction of certain weapons that obviously aren't designed for recreation and those kinds of things. The pushback is criminals will figure out a way to get them no matter what kind of laws are there because criminals are, kind of break the law. So I want to be able to protect my home. And that's the rationale that they give. But I agree with you. I don't think that there is a good case to be made for the kind of open circulation of of weapons that we have in the States. Uh, Daryl, I want to ask you quickly about immigration. Now, the two presidential candidates this year seem to have completely opposite views on this. Now, without getting into Trump's proposed wall... And who will pay for it. (laughs) What what do you do with these divergent views on immigration in terms of a Christian reflection on that? Scripture says basically two things. On the one hand, a nation has a right to kind of define who it is and what its people are and have laws that will allow for a stable society and ask those all those kinds of questions. That's what governments are supposed to do. But there's also a very strong strand in Scripture talking about about protecting uh, the weak, about about being generous to the foreigner. In fact, in the corners of grain fields, they were supposed to leave a portion of the harvest for the visitor who could come and pick from the stalks and be fed as they traveled through the land. So there's a sort of principle of thinking about the stranger. The other, the that's foreigner. right, exactly. The stranger, the foreigner, the neighbor, however you want to put it. And so it says, you know, and you should do this because you knew what it was to be a slave. You knew what it was to be a foreigner. So it's a very deep moral value running through Scripture. So the question is, how do you balance those two? And what's made the, the immigration discussion particularly difficult in the United States is, is that initially it was a discussion primarily dealing with the Hispanic community coming into the United States. But in the last several years, the whole Middle Eastern dysphoria and the way people are moving out of the Middle East and, and the flow of Muslims into the country has added to the complexity of the conversation because there's concern about if there's open borders and you have Muslims coming into the United States, some of whom are purposely trying to infiltrate in order to do damage, you know, how do you protect yourself from that? So that's, that's added a whole other layer of complexity to the conversation. But the question is, you know, is there a way to balance this? Because you're actually also getting the world moving to your doorstep. You're getting the opportunity to talk about life with people and neighbors who are very different from yourself, who years ago, the only way you would have met them is if you'd gotten on a plane and flown a thousand miles. Now, Daryl, the question that your book poses? How would Jesus vote? It's not as though the book gives a tick the box answer to that. What is it that you want people to take away from the book? Well, the title of the book is designed to ask how it isn't who would Jesus vote for, it's how would Jesus vote? How would he have us think about approaching these variety of issues with their tensions and think about our neighbor? So my short answer, Jesus would vote for your neighbor. Jesus would get us to think beyond ourselves. Most politics is about self-interest. And so Jesus would get us to think beyond ourselves and think about our neighbor more as we think about the answers to these questions. And as we do that more and more, we have a different kind of uh, dynamic in our politics that I think could break some of the gridlock that we often see as people think only about their self-interest. Well, Daryl, the book is How Would Jesus Vote? Uh, It's out now. People can get that. It's great to talk to you about these, especially the the American politics and religion connection, which is somewhat confusing sometimes. Great to get your thoughts on it. It is confusing, and even Americans are confused. (laughs) And we'll probably be confused after the election as well. But you all have good understanding of how that works. (laughs) Thanks, Daryl. You've been listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. How would Jesus vote? There's lots of complex answers there from Daryl Bock, but hopefully it will inspire a conversation that will be passionate but also peaceful as people dialogue about these important issues. For more conversations like this, you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Just type Centre for Public Christianity in the search box to find us. Also, it would be great to hear from you, and it would help us out as well if you leave a rating or a review. 
Next week, we take a look at the spotlight investigation into clergy sexual abuse in Boston and what's happened 15 years on, including an interview with a very special guest. Join us then. Thank you.